coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition. An anonymous donor swoops in and saves San Diego's new downtown library, promising $15 million to finish construction. And we'll get a look at a dream home to help families facing medical emergencies. The house could be yours for 150 bucks. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Ferrian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. Four Occupy San Diego prote protesters are facing conspiracy charges tonight after an outburst during Mayor Jerry Sanders' State of the City address. Police arrested the protesters, charging them with disturbing a public assembly and conspiracy to commit a crime. The conspiracy charge carries a possible one-year jail sentence along with a $10,000 fine. Former San Diego City Councilman Harry Mathis is recovering tonight after robbers pistol whipped him with his own gun. Police say the robbers confronted Mathis outside his home in University City, and Mathis shot at them and missed. Then one robber took the gun and hit Mathis with it. Police say Mathis and his wife, as well as a neighbor, were locked in the couple's bathroom where, while the uh, suspects ransacked the home and set cars on fire, the suspects are still at large. Mathis is currently the chairman of the board of the Metropolitan Transit System. New headaches at the Sweetwater Union High School District. This time, school cafeteria workers are accused of stealing around a half million dollars worth of food. District officials say an investigation has been underway since last summer. Last week, prosecutors filed charges against five people connected to the district. They're accused of taking bribes in exchange for construction contracts. That same case also involves Southwestern College. It suspended nearly $6 million in construction contracts. The deals with uh, two companies who are also players in the investigation. Arraignments in the case are scheduled for tomorrow. A follow-up to a story we told you about yesterday regarding roadside call boxes. A county board has canceled the contract of a public relations firm that's been marketing roadside emergency services. Berkman Strategic Communications was tasked with promoting the county's 511 website, an arm of the call box program. The county board that oversees the call boxes is putting the marketing out to bid and turned down Berkman's suggestion of a cookbook campaign. Construction is finished on the last four miles of express lanes on Interstate 15. The stretch of road between State Route 78 and State Route 163 opens Monday. The lanes are open to carpools, buses, motorcycles, some clean air vehicles, and fast-track users. The San Diego Association of Government says the $1 billion project was completed on time and under budget. State regulators have passed new rules to try to prevent wildfires. Utilities will have to submit plans for preventing power line fires on days of high fire danger. Power lines are blamed for two wildfires that swept through San Diego County in 2007. The State Public Utilities Commission also wants power companies to increase efforts to clear brush around power lines. Student costs may be rising at University of California schools, but a record number of students applied to the system for next fall. UC San Diego received nearly 76,000 applications, nearly 14 percent more than last year. School officials also say more California high school students apply to UCSD. Well, UC campuses will be tobacco-free zones starting in 2014. Smoking and chewing tobacco will both be off limits, and tobacco sales and advertising won't be allowed at university buildings. Major League owners have put off approving the sale of the San Diego Padres. Commissioner Bud Selig says the owners want more clarity and technical information. Buyer Jeff Morad says he will work quickly to get those issues resolved. The Ronald McDonald House Charities of San Diego has been a home away from home for families in medical crisis for more than 30 years. This week, they launched their eighth annual Dream House raffle to help keep the program running for needy families. Imagine winning this grand prize for a $150 raffle ticket. Chuck Day is with the nonprofit Ronald McDonald House Charities. This year, we've found this incredible home in the North County. $2.2 million. We're sitting on two and a half acres, 4,500 square feet, five bedrooms, five baths. All the proceeds from the raffle will benefit the Ronald McDonald House, a place where 
Families like Jose Cabrera and Maribel Guzman call a home away from home. Living here temporarily has allowed them to see their premature baby, who tipped the scale at less than two pounds at birth. I see my son with my brother-in-law's wedding band around his wrist, and it's like, wow, it's, he was really small. That was three months ago, and his baby boy is still hospitalized. Today he's pretty big. He's a five-pounder baby now, so still a little small, you know what I mean? He looks like a little man trapped in a little baby's body, but he's doing pretty good. Typically, the children in the hospital that we serve are quite ill or seriously injured. So these families are in medical crisis. The average stay at the Ronald McDonald House is about 10 days, but families dealing with premature births or cancer have stayed up to seven months, almost free of charge. The house provides lodging for almost 20,000 people a year. That's why the Dream House raffle is so important. We are very fortunate to have a San Diego community that be, believes deeply in the San Diego Ronald McDonald House. And this Dream House raffle benefiting the house, you know, we, this last year we raised just over $2 million in net proceeds for the Ronald McDonald House. And every one of those dollars stayed here in San Diego so we can do what we can to make sure that we have all that we need for the families to come stay with us. There are more than 100 other prizes up for grab in the raffle with the grand prize drawing on May 19th. To register for the Dream House Raffle, go to sdraffle.com. San Diego is another step closer to a new central library downtown. Joanne has the latest on the project over at the Evening Edition Roundtable. The new downtown library fell short about $15 million in private donations, but an anonymous donor has agreed to fill in the gap. Mayor Jerry Sanders listed the project among his accomplishments yesterday in his State of the City address. We'll be told in the summer of 2013 when we opened the doors to our new central library. This project is on time and under budget and fully funded without a nickel of general fund money. Joining me now to talk about the new library and fundraising efforts is Mel Katz, fundraising chairman for the library. Mel, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Bring us up to speed. What did you have to do? What did the foundation have to do in order for this project to go through? Um, this project is um, being done in two different phases. Phase one, which the city council approved, and it, you go down to the library site, you see it. We're on the ninth floor of 10 floors already. And then phase two is $32.5 million. And we needed to raise that last $32.5 million to finish the project. And all this money, $185 million total, where 38% of it is coming from private sources, is going to be spent by January of 2013, so one year from now. So we were out raising this $32.5 million. You were here a couple of months ago. Weren't you $24 million short? $24 million short, and it was in November. And you said, you're so optimistic, but what if it doesn't happen? What if you don't raise the money? We raised the money. But did you raise the money, oh, or did, did somebody come in, swoop in, and, and help you out of a $15 million bind? Same thing. We're 100% funded. All the money is going to be spent by January 2013, and this project won't stop, and there won't be any money that's coming out of the city for this project. Do you have the money in the bank? This um, anonymous entity that came forward um, is um, basically guaranteeing that the money is there. So we've been having just amazing results from generous San Diegans who have been giving us money. But the pledges come in over you know, three to four years. So this anonymous entity is guaranteeing that all the money is there, that entirely the $32.5 million is there. So you have an anonymous entity making that guarantee. Obviously, they've got a pretty good name in the community because you believe them. Yes. <laughs> and they've made this guarantee. What did you have to do in order for the city to say, yes, you've met your requirement? Didn't they have to mm -hmm. approve this kind of a pledge? Oh, yeah. There's an entire um, agreement. And it's signed off by the city, and it's um, verified by the controller of the city. So it's ironclad. Who had to sign, had to sign that um, agreement? I, I had to sign it as, on behalf of the foundation. I'm not sure for the city, maybe the mayor, maybe the city attorney. I'm not sure on that. And then for sure, the city controller 
had to verify that all of this was right. Because before you can go on with this project for the city, they have to know that the money is there. So the great news that the mayor announced last night is our library that we've been talking about for 30 years is now 100% funded. And why did this entity want to remain anonymous? You do something like this, wouldn't you want your name all over the library? Wouldn't you want people to know? I think they don't want to um, maybe scare away other donors because we're going to still be fundraising. We have some great naming opportunities still out there for the capital campaign. We want to do an endowment campaign. We want to do a campaign for special programs. We really want to take this fundraising now into the community and have everyone be a part of this library. We have pavers on the courtyard, in the lobby, and in the auditorium that we're going to be selling for your name on it for $25 on up. So we want everyone in the community now to have ownership of this new library. So you say fundraising is not over. Are you going to continue, if you continue to raise money, does that anonymous donor contribute less? Uh, that, that anonymous donor has guaranteed that this 32 and a half million is there. And then we have so many um, donors who have come forward, you know, people like Darlene Shiley and Phyllis and Dan Epstein and um, the Price Chariot Family um, Fund. So all of the different names that you're familiar with have come forward, given large donations, and are happy with us using their names. But, but to be clear, if, if you raise another $8 million, because tomorrow a, a number of people call you up and they want to give you more money, does that mean the anonymous entity gives you $8 million less? Yes. And also, it means that we're going to also go after more money than the original 32 and a half for the last phase because of what I was talking about, both special programming and endowment. We want to keep our library open many more hours than it currently is, and that's what an endowment would do. I want to touch a little bit on redevelopment. We don't have a lot of time, but I read on your website $80 million of the total cost coming from redevelopment. Yes. Is that in jeopardy? Because No. no? Okay. No. That's, that's not in jeopardy. Um, the $20 million from the school district is not in jeopardy for the new charter school that's going to be on two floors in this library, and $20 million from the state in a state bond measure. So it really is an amazing example of a public-private partnership. It's $120 million from those three entities we just mentioned, and then $65 million coming from the private sector. So really, 38% from the private sector, it's a public-private partnership for an asset to this region that is going to be unbelievable. Well, we'll leave it there, Mel Katz. Thanks for coming back. Thank you. Thank you. The new Central Library was just one of the issues Mayor Sanders talked about last night. We'll have a look at some of the others in just a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, at 8, a look at the San Diego Flume, an amazing water project from a century ago, on Ken Kramer's About San Diego. Then at 8.30, go beyond the tourist traps to discover travel treasures in Ensenada, and check out the Baja 500 on Crossing South. Then at 9, Chief Inspector George Gently takes one last case before retiring, involving the man responsible for the death of his wife. That's all tonight on KPBS. He was desperate for fame. He clearly thought he was destined for greatness. To be remembered for all time. And reckless for glory. Custer was going to find the Indians and Custer was going to attack the Indians. There's no worry about how many Indians there are. Custer's last stand. The Indians said it was like a buffalo hunt. There was more Indians there than the military had bullets. On American Experience. Tuesday at 8 on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by One of the most difficult decisions facing seniors is where to live in their final years. KPBS reporter Allison St. John takes us to two very different senior communities. One is upscale, the other low rent. 
Hello. Ina Rubenstein lives at V, an upscale senior living community in La Jolla Village. We had decided a long time ago that we needed to uh, be at a place where we could age in place actively and not have to worry about getting sick later on. Ina and her husband Erwin moved into this airy two-bedroom apartment on the seventh floor of V two years ago. It's a continuing care retirement community that includes assisted living and skilled nursing care for its residents. We will look for one that uh, where the monthly rate does not change as you move from one section to another. And, and when we were looking, there were only three in the area. To qualify to live here, the Rubensteins had to be both financially and physically healthy. The idea is that you come in when you're healthy and active and you live with us for the rest of your life at whatever level of care you should need. And if you need to move to higher levels of care, you don't pay any more than what you did in independent living. Residents of V pay an entrance fee and then between about $3,000 and $6,000 a month to live here, depending on the size of their apartment. Everyone has access to the community's amenities. The restaurant downstairs, we have more comfort foods. We have your meatloaf, your roasted chicken, uh, roasted turkey, that sort of thing. Uh, but we also have fresh fish every day. And upstairs, more composed like you're going out to dinner at a nice restaurant downtown. Until the economic downturn, there was a waiting list to get into V. As quickly as an apartment became available, we would call someone from the wait list, and it was likely that they would take the next available apartment. However, in 2008, one thing was changed a little bit, and it happened to have coincided with our putting up our new tower with an additional 184 apartments. Um, things slowed down a bit. In this economic climate, upscale senior communities often have trouble filling their space. Meanwhile, at the other end of the financial spectrum, affordable assisted living, like this project in City Heights, often have waiting lists. Josie Davis is 76. She lives at City Heights Square, affordable senior housing run by Senior Community Centers, a private nonprofit. Her late husband was in the military, and she now lives on his pension of about $1,000 a month. The rent is, is still a cheap because it's 577 my rent here. This is only studio, you see, because I can't afford to have the one bedroom, one bedroom will be 600 and something. Davis lives alone, but surrounded by her memories. Well, when I was young, I didn't have that much wrinkle as I have now. Activities here are limited. Uh, some residents, they play that games, you know, domino and uh, card game in the uh, lunch room. You know, they do that and they have Moby every Friday. There is breakfast and lunch every day. Davis sometimes goes to the food bank to get food she cooks for herself in the evening. Nurse Carolyn Stevenson keeps an eye on more than 100 seniors living in this complex. We're showing here in City Heights that if we provide an affordable place to live, we provide nutrition, we provide supportive services, people can live here for the rest of their lives and die here, which actually is a good thing because it means they aren't dying in an emergency room, a hospital, or a long-term care facility. To qualify to live here, seniors have to be 62 and have an income below about $26,000 a year. Paul Downey of Senior Community Center says most of the residents live on less than $12,000 a year. Rent is subsidized, so they don't pay more than 60% of their income. When we look at the, the gaps in services and the numbers of seniors who don't have adequate income in San Diego and in the state of California, that is a deep concern, and when you multiply that by the demographics that we're going to double the number of seniors in this country between today and 2030, it's a real problem. The Elder Index suggests more than 40 percent of seniors in San Diego struggle to make basic ends meet. What I have here is, you know, a place for me to stay, to sleep, to come home to. I have a place to come home to, so I'm thankful for that, that I'm not on the street. That was KPBS reporter Allison St. John. The California Elder Index shows the high cost of living in San Diego means a single senior needs income of 23000 a year to pay for basic bills, while a senior couple needs about 30000 As you may have heard earlier, Mayor Jerry Sanders announced funding for the new Central Library downtown was on track. Joanne is at the roundtable with more analysis on the mayor's State of the City speech.
It sounded a lot like a victory speech last night. Mayor Jerry Sanders gave the State of the City address, his final address, as he will be termed out of office this year. Now take a look at this entrance into the Balboa Theater last night. Joining me now to talk about the address and more about this grand entrance is political scientist Carl Luna. Carl is a professor of political science at San Diego Mesa College and a lecturer on politics and international political economy at the University of San Diego. Carl, thanks for being here. Nice to be here. Let's talk about this entrance, the theme song, Hell's Bells. This was Trevor Hoffman's song, the infamous closer for the Padres. Now, is Mayor Jerry Sanders a closer? He's trying to be. He might be reaching the beginning of the closing on a lot of his projects, like getting the new uh, Chargers Stadium. Uh, we may be nearing the end of the beginning on that one. So the, his address did talk a lot about these big projects. You mentioned the Charger Stadium. Earlier in the show, we talked about the library, the expanded convention center. I mean, this is the end of his term. And uh, I mean, some of these projects are really an unfunded pipe dream, like the Chargers. You know, all of these projects have been talked about even before Jerry Sanders was in office. And it's kind of like the San Diego legacy. It takes us a while to get things done. So at least he's moved some of these projects forward to the point they can be completed, like the library, maybe a charger stadium, whether there should or not be, that's something they're going to move toward. One of the interesting things, though, is Jerry Sanders reflects that tradition in San Diego, where San Diego is basically from Harbor Drive to I-5. Big focus on the downtown. Meanwhile, Sierra Mesa, Linda Vista, you don't get quite as much attention for the big projects. Well, he also talked about making the city more efficient, though, cutting costs, um, uh, managed... Um Competition. Competition, yep. exactly. So is, was that fair? I mean, should he be taking credit for running the city more efficiently? On the plus side, under his management, you managed to cut what had been a horrific budget deficit to something manageable that may disappear. On the other side of that, you did sacrifice a degree of service, libraries, police, fire, parks. So the city is not, even though it's balancing its books and is more efficient, it's delivering less for what it used to take than it's taking in. Roads are in not a very good state if you've been riding around and feeling your suspension disappearing on you lately. Well, he talked about roads because this is something that when this mayor came in, he promised to fix infrastructure, fix roads, sewer, uh, sewer lines, etc. He did say in his address last night that they were going to spend more next year than they had in previous years. So is this something that now he's hurrying up to do before he leaves to sort of fulfill this promise? It's kind of like what they do on those house channels where you have to make a curb appeal before you leave and sell the property. <laughs> so he's cleaning up some of the stuff. The problem is after 10 years of budget problems, there's a huge backlog. But Bulla Park still has tens of millions of dollars that needs to be done. And it's something like 25 Five percent of our roads are now subgrade. There's actually more roads that need that are in worse state than when he came in. He just can't catch up yet, and it's going to take a decade of more revenue to, for other mayors to fix. I want to talk a little bit about homelessness too. He also took credit for um, ending, uh, a, well, not ending a problem, but creating a comprehensive approach to homelessness, a model for other cities grappling with this problem, and also saying that in 2012, the first year of memory in San Diego won't need to open a winter homeless shelter because beds and services will already be waiting. Now, I want to tell you, tell the people at home, I did contact Peter Kalstrom, Regional Task Force on Homelessness, who calls this a, a good effort, a bold effort, but it won't be enough to house the 1,000 ha homeless people in the city of San Diego. You mentioned early on about sort of development projects, the downtown. Was this an area that our mayor was, was sort of um, working on or devoted to? The homeless situation is better, just as the mayor was saying. You're looking to be more comprehensive in your round. That being said, if you go down to Imperial Avenue at night, you still see a large number of people moving around. Bad economy, better climate, people drifting in. It's a problem that we tend to try to deal with and mostly shuffle around. You moved homelessness from in front of the county uh, board of supervisors building now out to East Village. You build a Chargers stadium, you'll move it to National City. What should the mayor's legacy be? Jerry Sanders didn't get uh, removed from office. They didn't have a recall. That's always nice in San Diego. He closed the budget gap and dealt with a lot of the major budget issues. We still have structural problems with the pension. We're still too dependent on markets and stock markets up. We're doing better. Uh, if you take another market dive, we could be right back where we are in that, eight years ago with the next mayor who comes in. So there's still a lot of variation. All in all, he's probably an above average mayor given the last couple of mayors he had. Okay, Carl Luna, thanks for being here. Thank you. Nice to be here. We'll hear some of your thoughts on the job Mayor Sanders has done in just a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition.
I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour, success stories in the battle against pediatric cancer, plus the latest on the presidential campaign. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. Tuesday at 10 on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight, we want to hear from you. What do you think of San Diego Mayor Jerry Sanders' performance as mayor? Is he a closer? I want to read a quick comment from kpbs.org. Now, this comes from frequent contributor P. King Duck. He says, I think Sanders has been a decent mayor. Not great, but decent. For people who think Sanders has been terrible, I ask you to envision one of these two nightmares, Mayor Carl DeMaio, Mayor Bonnie Dumanis. And of course, as you know, both Carl DeMaio and Bonnie Dumanis are running for mayor. Now, what do you think? Write to me, jferian at kpbs.org, or you can follow us on Twitter, of course, or like us on Facebook. And now let's go back to the news desk where Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. For Occupy San Diego, protesters face criminal charges after trying to disrupt Mayor Sanders' final State of the City address last night. They were charged with disturbing a public assembly and conspiracy to commit a crime. A former San Diego City Councilman is recovering after robbers pistol-whipped him with his own gun. Police say Harry Mathis was confronted outside his home in University City last night. The robbers ransacked the home and set Mathis's car on fire before getting away. And this was the day the San Diego Padres sale was supposed to be final, but Major League Baseball owners balked. They want more information before they approve the deal. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. We leave you with a look at the forecast.